This reading is brought to you by Audio Anarchy, an attempt to bring accessibility to learning around the world. The Conquest of Bread by Pyotr Kropotkin. Chapter 1 Our Riches. The human race has traveled far since those bygone ages when men used to fashion their rude implements of flint and lived on the precarious spoils of the chase, leaving to their children, for their only heritage, a shelter beneath the rocks, some poor utensils, and nature, vast, ununderstood, and terrific, with whom they had to fight for their wretched existence. During the agitated times which have elapsed since and which have lasted for many thousand years, mankind has nevertheless amassed untold treasures. It has cleared the land, dried the marshes, pierced the forests, made roads. It has been building, inventing, observing, reasoning. It has created a complex machinery, wrested her secrets from nature. And finally, it has made a servant of steam, and the result is that now the child of the civilized man finds ready at its birth to his hand an immense capital accumulated by those who have gone before him. And this capital enables him to acquire, merely by his own labor, combined with the labor of others, riches surpassing the dreams of the Orient expressed in the fairy tales of the Thousand and One Nights. The soil is cleared to a great extent fit for the reception of the best seeds, ready to make a rich return for the skill and labor spent upon it, a return more than sufficient for all the wants of humanity. The methods of cultivation are known. On the wide prairies of America, each hundred men, with the aid of powerful machinery, can produce in a few months enough wheat to maintain 10,000 people for a whole year. And where man wishes to double his produce, to treble it, to multiply it a hundredfold, he makes the soil, gives to each plant the requisite care, and thus obtains enormous returns. While the hunter of old had to scour 50 or 60 square miles to find food for his family, the civilized man supports his household with far less pains and far more certainty on a thousandth part of that space. Climate is no longer an obstacle. When the sun fails, man replicates it by artificial heat, and we see the coming of a time when artificial light also will be used to stimulate vegetation. Meanwhile, by the use of glass and hot water pipes, man renders a given space 10 and 50 times more productive than it was in its natural state. The prodigies accomplished in industry are still more striking. With the cooperation of those intelligent beings, modern machines, themselves the fruit of three or four generations of inventors, mostly unknown, a hundred men manufacture now the stuff to clothe 10,000 persons for a period of two years. In well-managed coal mines, the labor of a hundred miners furnishes each year enough fuel to warm 10,000 families under an inclement sky. And we have lately witnessed twice the spectacle of a wonderful city springing up in a few months at Paris without interrupting in the slightest degree the regular work of the French nation. And if the manufacturers, as in agriculture, and as indeed through our whole social system, the labor, the discoveries, and the inventions of our ancestors profit chiefly the few, it is nonetheless certain that mankind in general, aided by the creatures of steel and iron which it already possesses, could already procure an existence of wealth and ease for every one of its members. Truly, we are rich, far richer than we think rich in what we already possess, richer still in the possibilities of production, of our actual mechanical outfit, richest of all in what we might win from our soil, from our manufactures, from our science, from our technical knowledge, were they but applied to bringing about the well-being of all. We, in civilized societies, are rich. Why then are the many poor? 
Why this painful drudgery for the masses? Why, even to the best paid workmen, this uncertainty for the morrow? In the midst of all the wealth inherited from the past, and in spite of the powerful means of production, which could ensure comfort to all in return for a few hours of daily toil. The socialists have said it and repeated it unwearyingly. Daily they reiterate it, demonstrating it by arguments taken from all the sciences. It is because all that is necessary for production, the land, the mines, the highways, machinery, food, shelter, education, knowledge, all have been seized by the few in the course of that long story of robbery, enforced migration, and wars, of ignorance and oppression, which has been the life of the human race before it had learned to subdue the forces of nature. It is because, taking advantage of alleged rights acquired in the past, these few appropriate today two-thirds of the products of human labor, and then squander them in the most stupid and shameful way. It is because, Having reduced the masses to a point at which they have not the means of subsistence for a month or even for a week in advance, the few only allow the many to work on condition of themselves receiving the lion's share. It is because these few prevent the remainder of men from producing the things they need and force them to produce not the necessaries of life for all, but whatever offers the greatest profits to the monopolists. In this is the substance of all socialism. Take, indeed, a civilized country. The forests which once covered it have been cleared, the marshes drained, the climate improved. It has been made habitable. The soil, which bore formerly only a coarse vegetation, is covered today with rich harvests. The rock walls in the valleys are laid out in terraces and covered with vines bearing golden fruit. The wild plants, which yielded naught but acrid berries or uneatable roots, have been transformed by generations of culture into succulent vegetables or trees covered with delicious fruits. Thousands of highways and railroads furrow the earth and pierce the mountains. The shriek of the engine is heard in the wild gorges of the Alps, the Caucasus, and the Himalayas. The rivers have been made navigable. The coasts, carefully surveyed, are easy of access. Artificial harbors, laboriously dug out and protected against the fury of the sea, afford shelter to the ships. Deep shafts have been sunk in the rocks. Labyrinths of underground galleys have been dug out where coal may be raised or minerals extracted. At the crossings of the highways, great cities have sprung up, and within their borders, all the treasures of industry, science, and art have been accumulated. Whole generations that lived and died in misery, oppressed and ill-treated by their masters and worn out by toil, have handed on this immense inheritance to our century. For thousands of years, Millions of men have labored to clear the forests, to drain the marshes, and to open highways by land and water. Every rood of soil we cultivate in Europe has been watered by the sweat of several races of men. Every acre has its story of enforced labor, of intolerable toil, of the people's sufferings. Every mile of railway, every yard of tunnel has received its share of human blood. The shafts of the mine still bear on their rocky walls the marks made by the pick of the workman who toiled to excavate them. The space between each prop in the underground galleys might be marked as a miner's grave, and who can tell what each of these graves has cost in tears, in privations, in unspeakable wretchedness to the family who depended on the scanty wage of the worker cut off in his prime by fire damp, rockfall, or flood. The cities, bound together by railroads and waterways, are organisms which have lived through centuries. Dig beneath them, and you find, one above another, the foundations of streets, of houses, of theaters, of public buildings. Search into their history, and you will see how the civilization of the town, its industry, its special characteristics, 
have slowly grown and ripened through the cooperation of generations of its inhabitants before it could become what it is today. And even today, the value of each dwelling, factory, and warehouse which has been created by the accumulated labor of the millions of workers now dead and buried is only maintained by the very presence of labor is only maintained by the very presence and labor of legions of the men who now inhabit that special corner of the globe. Each of the atoms composing what we call the wealth of nations owes its value to the fact that it is a part of the great whole. What would a London dockyard or a great Paris workhouse be if they were not situated in these great centers of international commerce? What would become of our mines, our factories, our workshops, and our railways without the immense quantities of merchandise transported every day by sea and land? Millions of human beings have labored to create this civilization on which we pride ourselves today. Other millions, scattered through the globe, labor to maintain it. Without them, nothing would be left in 50 years but ruins. There is not even a thought or an invention which is not common property, born of the past and the present. Thousands of inventors, known and unknown, who have died in poverty have cooperated in the invention of each of these machines which embody the genius of man. Thousands of writers, of poets, of scholars have labored to increase knowledge, to dissipate error, and to create that atmosphere of scientific thought without which the marvels of our century could never have appeared. And these thousands of philosophers, of poets, of scholars, of inventors have themselves been supported by the labor of past centuries. They have been upheld and nourished through life, both physically and mentally, by legions of workers and craftsmen of all sorts. They have drawn their motive force from the environment. The genius of a Seguin, a mayor, a grove, has certainly done more to launch industry in new directions than all the capitalists in the world, but men of genius are themselves the children of industry as well as of science. Not until thousands of steam engines had been working for years before all eyes, constantly transforming heat into dynamic force, and this force into sound, light, and electricity, could the insight of genius proclaim the mechanical origin and the unity of the physical forces. And if we, children of the 19th century, have at last grasped this idea, if we know now how to apply it, it is again because daily experience has prepared the way. The thinkers of the 18th century saw and declared it, but the idea remained undeveloped because the 18th century had not grown up like ours, side by side with the steam engine. Imagine the decades that might have passed while we remained in ignorance of this law, which has revolutionized modern industry. Had Watt not found at Soho skilled workmen, to embody his ideas in metal, bringing all the parts of his engine to perfection so that steam, pent in a complete mechanism, had rendered more docile than a horse, more manageable than water, became at last the very soul of modern industry. Every machine has had the same history, a long record of sleepless nights and of poverty of disillusions and of joys, of partial improvements discovered by several generations of nameless workers who have added to the original invention these little nothings, without which the most fertile idea would remain fruitless. More than that, every new invention is a synthesis, the resultant of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics and industry. Science and industry, knowledge and application, discovery and practical realization leading to new discoveries, cunning of brain and of hand, toil of mind and muscle, all work together. Each discovery, each advance, each increase in the sum of human riches owes its being to the physical and mental travail of the past and the present. By what 
right, then, can anyone, whatever, appropriate the least morsel of this immense whole and say, this is mine, not yours. It has come about, however, in the course of the ages traversed by the human race, that all that enables man to produce and to increase his power of production has been seized by the few. Sometime, perhaps, we will relate how this came to pass. For the present, let it suffice to state the fact and analyze its consequences. Today, the soil, which actually owes its value to the needs of an ever-increasing population, belongs to a minority who prevent the people from cultivating it, or do not allow them to cultivate it according to modern methods. The mines, though they represent the labor of several generations and derive their sole value from the requirements of the industry of a nation and the cleansity of the population, the mines also belong to the few. And these few restrict the output of coal or prevent it entirely if they find more profitable investments for their capital. Machinery, too, has become the exclusive property of the few. And even when a machine incontestably represents the improvements added to the original rough invention by three or four generations of workers, it nonetheless belongs to a few owners. And if the descendants of the very inventor who constructed the first machine for lace making a century ago were to present themselves today in a lace factory at Bale or Nottingham and demand their rights, they would be told, hands off, this machine is not yours. And they would be shot down if they attempted to take possession of it. The railways, which would be useless as so much old iron without the teeming population of Europe, its industry, its commerce, and its marts, belong to a few shareholders. Ignorant, perhaps, of the whereabouts of the lines of rails which yield them revenues greater than those of medieval kings. And if the children of those who perished by thousands while excavating the railway cuttings and tunnels were to assemble one day, crowding in their rags and hunger to demand bread from the shareholders, they would be met with bayonets and grape shot to disperse them and safeguard vested interests. In virtue of this monstrous system, the son of the worker, on entering life, finds no field which he may till, no machine which he may tend, no mine which he may dig, without accepting to leave a great part of what he will produce to a master. He must sell his labor for a scant and uncertain wage. His father and his grandfather have toiled to drain this field, to build this mill, to perfect this machine. They gave to the work the full measure of their strength. And what more could they give? But their heir comes into the world poorer than the lowest savage. If he obtains leave to till the fields, it is on condition of surrendering a quarter of the produce to his master, and another quarter to the government and the middleman. And this tax, levied upon him by the state, the capitalist, the lord of the manor, and the middleman, is always increasing. It rarely leaves him the power to improve his system of culture. If he turns to industry, he is allowed to work, though not always even that only on condition that he yield a half or two-thirds of the product to him whom the land recognizes as the owner of the machine. We cry shame on the feudal baron who forbade the peasant to turn a clod of earth unless he surrendered to his lord a fourth of his crop. We call those the barbarous times. But if the forms have changed, the relations have remained the same, and the worker is forced, under the name of free contract, to accept feudal obligations. For, turn where he will, he can find no better conditions. Everything has become private property, and he must accept or die of hunger. The result of this state of things is that all our production tends in the wrong direction. Enterprise takes no thought for the needs of the community. 
Its only aim is to increase the gains of the speculator. Hence, the constant fluctuations of trade, the periodical industrial crises, each of which throws scores of thousands of workers on the streets. The working people cannot purchase with their wages the wealth which they have procured. And industry seeks foreign markets among the moneyed classes of other nations. In the East, in Africa, everywhere, in Egypt, Tonkin, or the Congo, the European is thus bound to promote the growth of serfdom. And so he does. But soon he finds everywhere similar competitors. All the nations evolve on the same lines, and wars, perpetual wars, break out for the right of precedence in the market. Wars for the possession of the East, wars for the empire of the sea, wars to impose duties on imports and to dictate conditions to neighboring states, wars against those, quote, blacks who revolt. The roar of the cannon never ceases in the world. Whole races are massacred. The states of Europe spend a third of their budgets in armaments, and we know how heavily those taxes fall on the workers. Education still remains the privilege of a small minority, for it is idle to talk of education when the workman's child is forced at the age of 13 to go down into the mine or to help his father on the farm. It is idle to talk of studies, to the worker who comes home in the evening crushed by excessive toil with its brutalizing atmosphere. Society is thus bound to remain divided into two hostile camps, and in such conditions, freedom is a vain word. The radical begins by demanding a greater extension of political rights, but he soon sees that the breath of liberty leads to the uplifting of the proletariat. And then he turns round, changes his opinion, and reverts to repressive legislation and government by the sword. A vast array of courts, judges, executioners, policemen, and jailers is needed to uphold these privileges. And this array gives rise in its turn to a whole system of espionage, of false witness, of spies, of threats and corruption. The system under which we live checks in its turn the growth of the social sentiment. We all know that without uprightness, without self-respect, without sympathy and mutual aid, humankind must perish. As perish the few races of animals still living by rapine or the slave-keeping ants. But such ideas are not to the taste of the ruling classes, and they have elaborated a whole system of pseudoscience to teach the contrary. Fine sermons have been preached on the text that those who have should share with those who have not, but he who would act out this principle is speedily informed that these beautiful sentiments are all very well in poetry, but not in practice. To lie is to degrade and besmirch oneself, we say. And yet, all civilized life becomes one huge lie. We accustom ourselves and our children to hypocrisy, to the practice of a double-faced morality. And since the brain is ill at ease among lies, we cheat ourselves with sophistry. Hypocrisy and sophistry become the second nature of the civilized man. But a society cannot live thus. It must return to truth or cease to exist. Thus, the consequences which spring from the original act of monopoly spread through the whole of social life. Under pain of death, human societies are forced to return to first principles, the means of production being the collective work of humanity. The product should be the collective property of the race. Individual appropriation is neither just nor serviceable. All belongs to all. All things are for all men, since all men have need of them, since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them, and since it is not possible to evaluate every one's part in the production of the world's wealth. All things are for all. 
Here is an immense stock of tools and implements. Here are all those iron slaves which we call machines, which saw and plane, spin and weave for us, unmaking and remaking, working up raw matter to produce the marvels of our time. But nobody has the right to seize a single one of these machines and say, this is mine. If you want to use it, you must pay me a tax on each of your products. Any more than the feudal lord of medieval times had the right to say to the peasant, this hill, this meadow belong to me, and you must pay me a tax on every sheaf of corn you reap and every rick you build. All is for all. If the man and the woman bear their fair share of work, they have a right to their fair share of all that is produced by all, and that share is enough to secure them well-being. No more of such vague formulas as the right to work or to each the whole result of his labor. What we proclaim is the right to well-being well-being for all. Thus ends chapter one of Pyotr Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread. So initial reactions to this, uh, it stands to a lot of reason. I really like some of his reasoning here that you cannot discount the arc of history in producing like what we currently have, the wealth that we currently have. It is, ownership is, is a, bizarre concept in the context of the the massive uh, 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 web of human enterprise leading to the present moment and then the present moment after that and after that. Uh, many of his points are not just salient, but frankly, it, astoundingly predictive. You know, the carceral state has only gotten worse. Military spending uh, is even further out of control than it ever was, especially in the United States. There's also the the uh, discussion of constant wars to continue to support capital, and it's very difficult not to see those ongoing as they are. Um, I would say, I mean, my main problem, obviously, with this first chapter is uh, Kropotkin uh, is writing in a bit of a dated style with some problematic phrasing, baby, by 2020 standards. Oh, wait, it's 2021, the year of everything being okay. Just kidding. So anyhow, yeah, this, this, this chapter, I think, has a lot of great philosophical ideas in it that are worth interrogating. Not least of which is the way in which capitalism uses violence and the threat of starvation, homelessness, deprivation as ways to coerce the working class into producing labor. So uh, go on out there, you crazy anarchists, and uh, enjoy the cooperation of intelligent beings, modern machines, and labor. Seize the means of production, y'all.